Okay, thank you. I'm going to introduce you. Yuri, right? Am I, yes, am I, yes I, that's a good pronunciation. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Today we have Yuri with us from Facebook AI. Yuri is a research engineer at Facebook AI, working with Jan Nikun on self-supervised learning. He's also going to talk about their recent work on Barlow twins together. Um, while at Facebook, he also worked with Larry Zitnik on accelerating MRI machines using deep learning. He received his PhD from University of Ljubljana, I think I did it right, on the topic of stereo vision. And we are looking forward to your talk, Yuri. Cool. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and also thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so before I start the presentation, uh, let me also mention the collaborators that worked on me, uh, that worked with me on this project. So thank you to Li Jing, Ishan Misra, Jan Lacun, and Stefan Denis, all from Facebook Air Research. Cool. So let me just get started. Um, and by the way, it's okay if you have any questions to just interrupt me during the talk. It's probably easier for me this way than to postpone the questions until the end. Okay. So. Um, Barlow Twins is a method for self-supervised learning. And before I actually talk about Barlow Twins, I just want to spend a few slides talking about self-supervised learning in general. So self-supervised learning aims to learn useful representations of the input data without relying on human annotations. So an example of a system is sort of sketched below. So imagine you have a big data set of images so without the corresponding labels, just a data set of images. So what you would like to do is you would like to train an encoder network, F, parameterized by weights theta. Um, so F extracts from each input image uh, a representation that's useful. Um, and I guess it's a bit ambiguous what useful means, but you can imagine useful meaning that you can then use this representation in various tasks like image classification, object detection, instance segmentation, and, and so on. So your goal is to sort of train F using only a data set of images. Um, and I'm showing images here, but this could just as well be an other data, like uh, videos or audio or text and, and so on. But in this work, we mostly deal with images. Um, so a popular approach to self-supervised learning is to train a pair of networks on distorted versions of image samples. So let me try to explain how, how this general approach works, because a lot of methods that do self-supervised learning sort of have this, have, have this uh, common outline. So um, you have a batch of images on the input. So I'm only showing one image here, but you have to imagine there's a batch of images. Uh, and then for each image in the batch, you derive two versions of that image that are sort of distort the distorted versions of the, of the input sample. And the way you derive them is by just using random data augmentations. So examples of data augmentations that are typically used are uh, random resizing and cropping. Uh, we have random horizontal flipping of the image. Uh, then random uh, conversion to grayscale, and also some color jittering. So these are some examples of, of how you would derive two input images. Um, so once you have a batch of distorted images, you forward propagate them through your network F to obtain representations, ZA and ZB. So uh, a row in this matrix, ZA, is a representation um, for a particular uh, distorted image. Um, so yeah, so, so ZA is a matrix that has batch size rows, and the number of columns in ZA is the same as the size of your embedding. Uh, and the way you, you would train this system is you would take uh, corresponding representation vectors from ZA and ZB. And then you want to make these vectors be close to each other. Uh, and one way to do this is that you can just measure the cosine similarity between these two vectors. Um, and you, you try to make the similarity as, as big as possible, basically. 
right? Um, but if you only do this, so if you only pull vectors together, you run into uh, what we call the collapse problem, where a network F basically learns to just output a constant representation, for example, a representation with all ones. So this sort of satisfies the loss from the previous slide, but the representation, the representation that you get in these ways are not, are not useful. So you're not happy when this happens. And different methods for self-supervised learning sort of have different uh, mechanisms to sort of solve this collapse problem. Um, and now let's look at some methods and how they attempt to solve this, this collapse problem. So recently there's been a lot of work in this area of self-supervised learning. So here I'm only showing four methods, Simclear, Suave, BYOL, and, and SimSiam. But there are many, many others that, that just recently came out. Um, so let me spend maybe a few minutes talking about how each of these methods handles the collect problem and how they are similar. Um, so they're all similar in the way that they have these two branches. So like I explained before, you start with a batch of images, X. Uh, then you derive two views of the input image using data augmentations. And then you further propagate these two images um, through F to obtain representations. So I think all four methods here basically do this. And then from this point on, they do things differently. Um, so, so let me talk about each method individually. So the way that Sinclair uh, handles the collapse problem is that it's modifies the loss function. Um, so instead of just pulling vectors together, it also pushes vectors apart. So in other, in other words, it's using contrastive learning to, to prevent the collapse problem. Um, another very popular method, um, a good one is BYOL, uh, bootstrap your own latent. Uh, and the way that they handle the collapse problem is different. So they don't modify the loss function. So they only pull vectors together, uh, but they change the architecture to prevent collapse. Uh, in particular, what they do is they first they break the asymmetry between the two branches uh, by introducing a, predict, a prediction MLP only in one branch. Uh, they also have stop gradient operations in one branch. And also the weights of the top and bottom branches don't share weights. Uh, in fact, the weights of the bottom branch here are obtained by using an exponential moving average of the blue branch. Um, I'm not sure if it's well understood why this prevents collapse, but their experiments show that, that it does, and the results that they get are, are really impressive. So, so that's also one way of preventing collapse by changing the architecture. And another method that's sort of similar to BYOL is uh, SimSiam, for example, where um, basically they handle the problem similarly to BYOL by changing the architecture, uh, but they show that it's enough to just introduce this predictor and stop gradient, same as BYOL, but you don't need this exponential moving average. So it's okay for the two branches to share uh, to prevent collapse. Okay, um, so now let me start talking about parallel twins. So this is the method that we sort of uh, proposed and we worked on. So Barlow Twins is a new method for self-supervised learning. Well, I guess it's not really a method, it's more of a loss function, uh, which means that we handle the collapse problem in a similar fashion to Sinclair by not changing the architecture too much, but just by changing the loss. Um, so ba what Barlow Twins does is that it applies the redundancy reduction principle to self-supervised learning. And the redundancy reduction principle is something that was first introduced in neuroscience by uh, Horace Barlow. So this is also where the name of our method comes from. Um, so Barlow twins achieves competitive results. So, so we don't get state-of-the-art results on most evaluations we run. Um, you can think of Barlow twins more of as a method that's different from other methods. It also behaves differently, but it still gets it still gets uh, good results, um, but we don't like just you know outperform everybody. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and like I said before, we don't 
modified architecture. So Faro Twins has no predictor network. We don't have any stop gradient operations. We don't have a momentum encoder. Uh, so that's the exponential moving average. And we don't have any non-differentiable operations like uh, clustering in SWAP, for example. Okay, so let me now try to explain how our method works. Um, so we start in the same way as I already explained. So we have a batch of images coming in. We obtain two distorted views of each input image in the batch by using data augmentations. Then we propagate these two batches through an encoder to get the representations ZA and ZB. So, so far, this is the same as all the other four methods that I mentioned before. But here is where things start to differ. So what we do then is we compute this thing, C, which is the empirical cross-correlation between the representation matrices ZA and ZB. Um, so let me spend some time on this. So if you look at, for example, uh, this entry here, so this is the CIJF entry in the matrix, so IJ. So you compute this uh, entry by taking the ith feature or a column of ZA and the j column of ZB, and you compute their correlation coefficient. So this is the dot product that's, that's normalized by the standard deviation. And before you do this, you have to subtract them here. Um, so the, the values in this empirical cross-correlation matrix are between minus one and one. Uh, so they are one when, when the two vectors are the same, and they are zero when they are uh, orthogonal to each other. Um, and what we would like is we would like that the empirical cross-correlation matrix be as close as possible to the identity matrix. And that's the loss that we uh, propose. Um, it's written here. And let me sort of walk you, walk you over it a little bit. So I split the loss into two terms. Uh, the first term deals with the on diagonal entries, so the CIIs. So we want each CII, so we want each value here on the diagonal to be as close as possible to one. Um, and this sort of enforces invariance to the distortions that were applied to the input. Um, so if the encoder is invariant to these distortions, then the uh, the diagonal terms will be will be one, and then the second term in our loss, which is weighted by this coefficient lambda here, uh, deals with the off-diagonal terms of the empirical cross-correlation matrix, and we want these terms to be as close as possible to zero. And what this term does is it basically tries to reduce the redundancy in our representation. So we want our representation to have features that are decorrelated. And so this is the term that is trying to prevent collapse in, in, in our method. OK, actually, before I, before I go on to the next slide, let me also uh, briefly unpack the encoder network. Uh, so the encoder network um, starts with a ResNet 50, which is a popular image classification network. Um, so we take everything up to and including the last bridge pooling layer, uh, but we don't take the final uh, fully connected layer. So representation that comes out of this is a vector of size 2048. We then forward propagate this vector of 2048 through three linear layers, uh, followed by batch norm and ReLU, to get a final representation that's of size 8,000. So, so, so this here, and this here is 8,000 in our case. So the reason why I put this up in bold is the fact that this is sort of the first place where we differ from other methods in the fact that Barlow Twins really only works well when you have these giant representations here. And this is not true for other methods like Simpler and BYOL, uh, where they work also well with smaller representations. So that's something that's different. And I'll talk about this a bit later on during the evaluation. Yuri, can I ask something about sure. the loss? Yes. Um, you have more off-diagonal elements than on-diagonal elements. 
would it yeah. like is there a trivial solution of setting everything to zero for the network did you encounter that problem all zeros kind so, of so yeah so so good question so the so the lambda here is trying to sort of balance these two terms so what you can what you could imagine having is also something like this where you would sort of normalize and i guess mm -hmm. one over right here where you would normalize these two terms by the number of uh you know terms in them uh but you can also fold this guy into lambda um and i think that's probably what we did um yeah so it's important to set lambda well um obviously um so yeah if you don't set it well you you, you can get a representation where one of these two things is ignored and then it doesn't work so well okay thank you um i i have a question if uh, mm -hmm. possible so let me just make sure if I understand right. So you said that the representation vector we're getting for each sample is uh, a thousands, and the matrix here Z A, and we have another matrix Z B, right? And we're we're trying to calculate the cross correlation between these matrices, and this is done basically. So we we are doing this batchwise, right? Yeah, so, so another way to uh, write this is to say that C is obtained by doing ZA transpose uh, multiplied by ZB. Oh, so the size, the size of the C matrix here, the, the correlation matrix is B by B, given no, that no, it's, B is yeah, the size. So, so, okay, so let, let me, let me so, so if ZA is of size B and D, where B is the batch size and D is the, the machinality, 8,000 in our case, then C is D times D. So it's 8,000 by 8,000 in our case. The, the batch is used to compute the values of, of C. So, so when you're computing C, you're doing a dot product of two vectors that have size B. Thanks. I hope it made it made sense. Um, cool. Okay, so let me um, yeah, okay, so this slide. So this slide basically has no new information. It's the same information as the previous slide, but some people work better with diagrams and some people work better with code, for example, me. Uh, so I'll just go over the algorithm one more time, this time in sort of fight or pseudocode and hopefully to clear up all the um, um, like uh, misconceptions okay so so you have a for loop that goes over all the batches in your data set and the first thing you do is you obtain these two augmented views uh, ya and yb by doing data augmentations random data augmentations uh, then you compute za and zb by forward propagating them through your encoder network f and then you have to normalize Z A and Z B. So, so what you do is you you take each uh, column of Z A, and you want to make sure that the mean is zero and that the standard deviation is one. And you do this by you know subtracting the mean along the phase dimension and dividing by the standard deviation computed again along the by, uh, by the base dimension. Um, and then to compute C, uh, you basically just do what I uh said on the previous slide you take z a you transpose it and you matrix multiply with with zp and and divide to, to normalize um and then to, co to compute your final loss you want to like i said before you want to make sure that c is close to the identity matrix um and there are many ways you can you can do this one way is you can subtract c from the identity matrix of the correct size and then square that and then you also have to take into account the lambda term uh, which weighs the off diagonal entries of the loss and the way you do this is just by you know grabbing all the off diagonal uh, entries of your cd matrix and then multiplying them by this coefficient lambda and once this is done you basically just sum and this is your loss function and mm -hmm. then can can I ask a question? Sure. 
Yeah. Uh, so in the previous function, the loss function, the collapse uh, scenario, I guess it, it, it generated zero loss, right? Yeah. Uh, and what does it, what do we get in the collapse scenario with this loss function? Yeah, good question. So let's say that uh, the encoder just outputs all ones here. Uh, everywhere. So the question is, how would the empirical cross correlation look like in, in this case? So in this case, I think what you get. Um, so I think what you would get is a vector of all ones because everything's correlated, right? So you you would get yes. So you would get again zeros, I guess. Uh, so yeah, in your matrix, uh, the diagonals would be one, and yeah, and you calculate your loss, you would again get zero. So I guess. Yeah. So so this term would be zero, but then this term would not be zero. This term would be very unhappy because you would also get ones on the off diagonal entries of C. So then this term wouldn't be happy at all with this representation. Ah. Huh. Okay. So you would get ones in the matrix or in the off diagonals too. Yes, because because two features... everything is the okay 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 yes, I, I understand that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So so that was basically our uh, so the way that Barrow's method works. And now let's just briefly talk about how uh, these methods are evaluated. Um, and typically, this is done by uh, transfer learning to different data sets and different tests in computer vision. So the evaluation protocol looks like this. So in the first step, we basically do what I was talking about now. So you pre-train using self-supervised learning on the ImageNet training set. And this is without using any labels, of course. Uh, and once the training is done, you go to the sec second step where you extract the ResNet 50. Actually, that's also important. Let me, let me just briefly go back um, to this slide here. So I said that the representation um, is 8,000. But when we were doing evaluation, we always take the vector from here. So we take the vector that's of size 2048. So, 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 so this representation that's of size 8,000 is only used for training Parlo twins. But when you're evaluating it, you take this representation here. So the so then it, it's it's more fair to compare Barlow twins to other methods which have a different projector. So all of these methods, when they are compared, they take the representation following ResNet. Um, right. So yes. um, did, yeah. did you actually try the eight thousand dimensional representation? Is that uh, too large to try, or does it give worse results? Um, I'm trying to remember if we tried. So I don't think we even tried it. So it, it, so first of all, it wouldn't be fair to compare to others, but it's easy to try. Uh, I'm just trying to remember if we did try it and what the results were. But I can't remember if we actually run this run this experiment. No problem. Thanks. So I think typically, yeah, yeah. I, I would rather just not say anything. Uh, but I think we probably tried, but I don't remember what the what the results were. Um, okay, so so you extract the resident 50, you forget about everything else that you train, and then you evaluate the weights of the resident 50 by doing different tasks in image classification, uh, in computer vision, like image classification, object detection, and instance segmentation. And you either freeze the weights of the ResNet and just basically think of the ResNet as a feature extractor, or you fine tune the weights of the ResNet. And then basically the self-supervised learning algorithm gives you just a good initialization um, for your training. Okay, uh, let me just check the time real quick. Okay, um, so let me go over some, some results. Uh, so, so the first thing we tried is uh, what happens when you also evaluate on ImageNet. Uh, so here now you do get the labels uh, in the second step. Um, the weights of the resonant here are fixed, uh, and you're only allowed to train a linear probe on top of this representation of size 2000. 
Um, and then you measure the top one accuracy and top five, top five accuracy. And so, like I said before, you know, we're not state of the art, but we're sort of, sort of always up there. So we get the top one accuracy of 73.2, which is behind BYOL and SWAP, but it's better than SimCM, MoCo version 2, Simplier, Perl, and MoCo version 1. Um, another uh, thing can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so what, what is the sort of ResNet 50 supervised result? Yes, yeah, it's here. So, oh, okay. So, and um, yeah. what, what, what is the reason for the difference? I mean, you're just initializing the, re the you're, you're not doing any more fine tuning or anything. You're just testing. Um, so I'm trying to understand how we got this, these numbers. So you take the ResNet from the pre-trained or, you know, self-supervised training regime uh -huh. and then do, do you change its weights at all do you fine tune it do you just uh, add a linear classifier at the end yeah so so here we don't fine tune so here the thing you get out of self-supervised learning is a fixed resnet 50 which basically uh, acts like a feature extractor right so each image is transformed into a vector of 2048 and then on this data set of vectors of size 2048, you are only allowed to train a linear classifier okay. um, using the ImageNet data set with labels. Um, and once you train this linear classifier, this is the validation accuracy. So it's 73.2. Whereas this row here tells you what happens uh, when you train the whole network supervised. From scratch, yeah. OK, thank you. So here we are worse, uh, which is sort of to be expected, right? I mean. Right, but we'll see later that there are also some cases where it makes sense actually to do self-supervised learning. Okay, um, actually here is an example. So, so here um, the first step is the same. So we train self-supervised learning on ImageNet, uh, and then this will always be the case. But here now, when we're evaluating, we're not using ImageNet to evaluate, but we're using different data sets to evaluate, uh, and we tried places, uh, VOC and INET. And this is the accuracies when you just train supervised. And we have something that's, at least in this case, a bit better than supervised. Well, here, I guess we're worse, but some other methods are better. Um, and again, so, sort of Barrow Twins is kind of up there. It's not the best method, but it's uh, among the uh, best methods. Um, so another thing we could do is we could allow the weight of the ResNet to change. So before we were basically just extracting features from the ResNet, and now we are treating the weights as a good initialization and then training from there. Um, but there's another tool that we do. We only use either 1% or 10% of ImageNet to, to finish training. Um, and here again, it's better if you do self-supervised learning than if you just do supervised learning. Um, and actually here, I think Barlatunis was at the time better than other methods, but I think since then we've been overtaken also here. Um, and another thing you could do is you can measure the accuracy, not on image classification, but on either object detection or instance segmentation. Uh, so here we train faster RCNN and mask RCNN using the self-supervised learning as uh, initialization. And then we allow the ResNet to change its weights. Um, and again, here we see that it's better to do self-supervised learning than to start with supervised learning initialization. Um, and again, I'm not going over all these numbers, but our method is sort of among the, the best methods. Um, Okay, so, so let me talk about two interesting effects which might connect Barlow twins to other methods. Um, one is how they handle when you change the batch size. So I'm comparing Barlow twins, which is the red line, with two other methods, BYOL and Simplier. Um, so on the X axis is different batch sizes for training. And on the y-axis is basically how much top one accuracy you lose when evaluating on ImageNet. Um, and you see that 
Barlow twins, if you look at like this low batch size regime, um, Barlow twins and BYOL sort of perform a bit better than, than Sinclair, where the performance drops really uh, badly when you decrease the batch size. So, so, so that's something to notice. Um, and if you look at a different graph, which is the effect of the dimensionality of the representation, so I already talked about this when I talked about the method, is that if you look at Barlow twins, it really only works well when the uh, dimensionality of the projector is really large. So, you know, uh, whereas BYOL and Sinclair seem to sort of be, you know, uh, work well with other even very low sizes of the of the projector dimensionality. So that's that's something that's that's interesting and that's different from other methods. Okay, so let me spend two more slides sort of comparing parallel twins to uh, yeah. can I ask a question before that? Yeah. Uh, do you use dropout in your model? Mm. No, we don't. We don't use dropout. There. So there's no dropout. So, yeah, so is there a reason for that? Because of your uh, loss function. So is there a reason why we don't use dropout? Did you um, try to use it? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I don't think we tried to use it. I don't think there's any reason for not using it. Um, we just didn't try. Like, you because, using dropout uh, like think, thinking back to your loss function, like I think it would, I don't know though, like without trying, uh, it, it seems to me that it would hinder the training, I guess, because you are directly comparing the um, each individual. Like with your output vectors from the two sides, you're comparing the diagonal of that matrix. So like randomly dropping out parts of your representation would hinder the training process. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We just didn't try. I don't know. Okay. But that's something that I think, yeah. Uh, not sure if other uh, self supervised learning methods you, you drop out. Um, I can't. Yeah, I think it's just something to try. I, I don't see uh, right now a reason why it wouldn't help or hinder. I would just need to try it. Okay. Um, so, so, okay, so let's compare uh, the Barrow Twins loss with other losses that are used in other self supervised learning methods. And let's start with the info NCE loss. So that's the law that's uh, used in, well, most notably Sinclair, I guess, uh, and also MoCo and uh, contrastive predicting coding. I've rewritten the two losses so that their similarities are emphasized. So this is the NCE loss shown here, and then the Barlow twins loss uh, is shown here. Um, so from like a high viewpoint, they, they both contain two terms. Uh, the first term is trying to make the representation invariant to transformations. And then the second term is trying to sort of maximize the variability of the representations. And something else that they have in common is that they use batch statistics to measure this variability. Um, and the way that these two losses differ is um is the objects that they're pulling and pushing apart so let me let me explain this so i guess what barlow twins is doing is it's pushing apart features or, or pulling them together whereas what simpler does uh, is it's pushing and pulling apart on uh samples so it's, it's almost like one is a transpose of, of the other um and uh yeah. So yeah. So that's and and another difference that uh, that you see between the two losses is the the actual loss that's used. 
So uh, in info NC, they use the uh, cross correlation loss, whereas we use uh, squared error loss to to push and pull uh, objects together and pull them apart. Okay. Um, oops. My, I think my computer froze. Okay. There we go. Um, right. So let's uh, then continue this comparison of our twins. This time, comparing them to uh, asymmetric twins. So two examples of asymmetric twins method would be BYOL and Simpsian. So what these methods do is they uh, basically compute the cosine similarity of corresponding uh, representations. And they don't have any contrastive terms where you push apart uh, representations. And so like I said before, these methods are different than Barlow twins in the way that they avoid collapse. So what they do is they change the architecture by, for example, having a momentum encoder, a predictor network, and stop gradient operations. Whereas our method is different in the fact that we don't modify the architecture, but we modify the loss. Um, another very interesting method is um, this method here, uh, WMSC by Ermolo. So what Barlow Twins does is it basically encourages whitening as a soft constraint. So by whitening, I mean that you want to make your correlation matrix be identity. And so we are enforcing this by this sort of soft constraint uh, in the loss function. But you can also imagine a method where the whitening is a hard constraint, where you actually have in your method a component that whitens the data. And you can do this, and they do this uh, by implementing whitening as a differentiable operator. Uh, they do it using the Koleski decomposition. Um, I think this is a very promising approach. So far, it turns out that it doesn't work as well as, as uh, our method. So they get an image net accuracy of 66.3, whereas I think Barrow Twins, uh, we got something like 73.2. So it's close, but sort of. Um, yeah, um, like a very interesting approach to self supervised learning as well. Okay. Um, so, one more thing maybe I would like to talk about is the connection to the information bottleneck principle. I, I won't spend a lot of time on, on, uh, on this slide, and I would just encourage everybody who is interested in this connection to uh, see our appendix, appendix A of our paper. Um, so, the information bottleneck principle applied to self-supervised learning states that you want representations to contain as much information about X as possible and as little information about the transformation as possible. Um, and you can sort of put this into an equation shown here, where you um, have the mutual information between uh, Y, which are the distorted images in your representation Z, and you want to minimize this term. And you have another term, uh, which is the mutual information between your representation Z and your images X, and you want to maximize this term. And then you can do some derivations. You can make some assumptions. I think in particular, the biggest assumption we make here is that we assume that uh, the Zs are distributed normally. Uh, and we need this assumption when we are computing the entropy of, of Z. And uh, so, like I said, after some derivations, you, you can show that you uh, arrive to the Barlow twins loss if you start from, from here. But yeah, I, I didn't go through the details. I would just invite um, people who are interested to, to see Appendix A of our paper. Um, uh, I, sorry. I, so, Miguel, go ahead. I can ask later. Uh, OK, sorry. I was just going to ask that uh, here you are trying to minimize the mutual information between the distorted images and representations, right? So, uh, I mean, is it meaningful? Because isn't this distorted image is just a transformation of the real image? Uh, I mean, it should include some mutual information, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I'll be completely honest. So I, I wasn't the person who was sort of like doing this derivation. Um, okay. We just included it in the paper because we thought it was interesting. I don't think we like fully developed it yet. Um, and I guess I can't really like answer. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Questions of that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no. Thank you. Fatma, you had a question? Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna ask that there was a discussion when the paper came out about like this redundancy increase, decrease thing. I guess the original Barlow paper says that redundancy should increase, but is this related to that or is it a completely different discussion? Yeah, I think this is sort of like a something we, we looked at uh, and it wasn't, so I think this is not how we, so when we were developing the method, we weren't thinking about this. This is just something interesting that came up later. Um, yeah, I don't think it's related to the too much to what I talked about before. But how did you find out about Barlow originally? That's also what I. <laughs> yeah. So, so the the last author, uh, Stefan Denis, is a neuroscientist. Uh, so in our group, we were sort of thinking about. So we were very inspired by the papers that came out, uh, BYOL, Sinclair, Malco, and so on, uh, and we wanted to explore this area. And uh, so, like I said, the last author is a neuroscientist, and he came up with this connection, and this sort of inspired him to to come up uh, with the with the idea for the method. Yeah. And he's, he was also the one that did this derivation. So I think it would be better to answer the questions regarding this. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I think a good reason to collaborate with people exactly. from other people. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so just before I conclude, I would like to mention a few potential further like future directions that you could take this work into. Uh, so one is the phenomenon that we saw in the ablation studies where we saw that increasing the dimensionality of the representation really helped the accuracy of borrowed twins in downstream tasks. And we basically, when we tried to increase it further, we ran into memory limits. So maybe a potential future direction would be something along these lines of how to reduce the memory requirements or just something along these lines. Um, and another one is you could also play with sort of small variations uh, on the actual Barlow twins loss. So for example, you can compute the redundancy reduction uh, instead of doing it on the cross correlation matrix, you do it on the auto correlation matrix. Um, so let me explain what I mean by this. So you can, instead of doing uh, this thing here, you take ZA, and you compute ZA transpose ZA to get the autocorrelation matrix here. And you do the same for ZB. And then you can measure the redundancy instead of here, the, of the diagonal entries of uh, the empirical cross correlation, you measure the um, redundancy here. And that's actually something that's been done recently in this paper, VCREG by uh, Adrian Bard. And they show that you can get similar results using um, this type of loss. Um, right, so to conclude, so we proposed a new method for self-supervised learning that's based on the redundancy reduction principle. And uh, method Barlow twins sort of performs on par with other state-of-the-art self-supervised learning methods. Um, I, th I think that's all I have for today. Yeah, so thank you for your attention and for your questions. And yeah, I'd be happy to try to answer more. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Can yes. I ask a, a, a question about this computation of correlation? Um, yeah. So, uh, by the way, thank you for this presentation. Uh, interesting ideas. So, uh, your loss functions and architectures rely on computation of correlation somehow, which is based on statistics right so here i guess you showed some uh, ablation studies but i i might have missed that part so uh, which something important here could be is actually the this reliability of this correlation uh, statistics right so usually you do it over batch samples so uh, probably there is a uh, so that depends probably this reliability depends very much on how you choose your batch data plus the size of your uh, batch, uh, actually. So what is your observation on this thing? Can you comment on this? Yeah, I agree. Uh, so the 
So the way that we compute the numbers here in this matrix uh, is by doing dot products of vectors that have size, batch size. So, so batch size is definitely important when, when you're computing these numbers. Um, it's interesting though that our method seems to sort of be kind of robust to batch size. So, and in this way, it sort of acts more like BYOL than in the than thing here, which mm -hmm. where the accuracy drops with uh, reduced batch size. Like, I'm not sure why this happens. I would, I would, if I had to guess before running the experiments, I would sort of think the opposite would happen. When you would have a small batch size, the estimates of your C would be bad and the method would work worse. But the experiments didn't show this. So even with smaller bed sizes, we were able to get good results. And I'm not, yeah, I, I was a bit confused by this result, to, to be honest. Uh, I was expecting uh, the opposite to happen. Also, the choice of, uh, I mean, how you choose your bed samples might also matter, huh? Yes. Uh, uh, but we just didn't experiment with this. Uh, okay. We just used the random uh, in samples. Um, but you're right, it might have been a good idea to pay attention to that. We just didn't do that. Yeah, no, for example, you get you have images, then distortions. Uh, so when you construct your sample batches, you get an image and then random distortion, or you get an image and some a set of random distortions, and that uh, somehow uh, builds your min mini batch. Or is there a certain strategy there? Yeah, I mean, maybe you don't remember, but that might also matter. Yeah. That's my. Uh, no, I agree. So that's so the way we choose the page is, is just we we didn't experiment with it and mm. we yeah, probably should. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Um, um, thank you for the talk uh, at first. So when when can can you go back to the results table? So you mentioned that we first train the or let's say that we pre-train the ResNet the backbone ResNet using this objective that you are explaining. And after that, we fine tune a linear layer, just that linear layer on the classes and we obtain the score, right? Am I right in this point? Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I come from language uh, background. So BERT and language models and stuff. So basically what, what we do in, 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 uh, in language there, I mean, we, we do the few shot learning thing as in, in GPT. So this is done by basically you first start by pre-training, you pre-train your model as in this, and you fine tune it, but you fine tune the whole model in a few shots, uh, basically you, you do the 1% or 10% training. So uh, in, in this training setting, you fine tune the whole model and not only the, just the, the, <clears throat> the head that you're adding. And, is it in, in this case the same thing that you you're doing or is it just yeah. fine tuning the no, so, 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 so in most experiments that I mentioned we were fixing the weight of the resonance but in this particular uh, slide here we're doing exactly what you uh, mentioned so so the resonance is free to change so it's not fixed and you're using uh, like a subset of image net labels to 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 evaluate Right. So I think this is exactly the, the scenario you mentioned. So, I, I think so, so basically, this, this, the, I mean, the, these tables are, are different in, in the training setting. Uh, right? I mean, training setting? Yeah, basically, in, in the first table, we don't fine tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't fine tune ResNet. In the second okay. table, we fine tune ResNet. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and in this table, we use the full ImageNet uh, label data set. And in the second one, where you're allowed to change, you only use 1% or 10% of, of the internet. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what other people use and that's why we use it just to compare ourselves to, to other methods. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Hey, hi. I also have a couple of questions if it is possible to ask. Sure. Um, so my first question is the regarding the batch sizes in the paper you are stating that the Performance is okay if we drop the base size to the 260 and 56, but is it possible to lower the base size uh, even more? Yeah, so so we, we tried going one lower. So um, I think we actually pushed this on our guide today. So before we only went up to here and the trend seems to continue in the sense that the drop is graceful. <laughs> Or at least we were dropping more gracefully than than B1L when we go to 128. Like the problem with going lower is that 
it takes longer to train uh, because you can't use as many machines. So training something size size 128 is slower than training something of beta size 4,000. Um, I don't think we're trying 64, um, but yeah. The train I seems think to be... And my second question is about the lambda term in the orthogonal computation of the loss function. Um, have you tried different um, um, like strategies such as uh, penalizing the indexes i and j uh, if the difference is high maybe you can um, apply a bigger lambda constraint on them so with this way maybe we can have a um, different maybe more um, different figure for the cross correlation term so can you can you describe again i don't think we tried it so but the idea is that you don't use a fixed lambda but the lambda is a function of cij or I'm not sure I understood the the suggestion. Uh, okay, the, the the thing is, what I'm suggesting is to use a dynamic lambda. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say the when the indexes are much farther away from each other, I I suggest that maybe we can increase the lambda, and if they are close, we can decrease it. Right. So the lambda would be then a function of like i minus j. So the difference between, I guess I would have to put the lambda here. Yeah. Um, Oh, we definitely didn't try that, um, but yeah, it, it might make sense um, to have, yeah. Yeah, that's something that actually we could try. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Great questions, everyone. Maybe one last question. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for your great, great presentation. Uh, sorry for the sound. And I would ask you to, uh, did you start to try on this idea directly on ImageNet data set uh, or uh, start to use uh, CIFAR 10 or tiny ImageNet and then implement on this to ImageNet. Yeah, uh, so in this particular uh, project, we just started on ImageNet because I think it all started with me sort of re trying to re-implement BYOL. So I had like uh, already something that is debugged and it was easy to uh, sort of derive the borrow twins from that code. Um, yeah, if, if I were starting from scratch, it probably would be a good idea to start with CIFAR first, just to debug everything and then move to ImageNet. But in this case, we, I don't think we even try to run it on, on CIFAR. I think the problem is that uh, the conclusions sometimes don't transfer from CIFAR to ImageNet. So what works well on CIFAR might not work well on ImageNet. Um, but it's definitely a good strategy for debugging things. But like I said, in this project, I already had PYL code, so I knew it was um, the debugging wouldn't be such an issue. So we just started with ImageNet. I think that's a good question. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone. And thanks to Yuri for this great talk and for answering all the questions. There were so many questions. It's great, right? It's, it's not usually yeah. the case. <laughs> um, I, I guess that's it. Do you have anything you would like to add or? Um, it's just, I would like to thank everybody for coming and yeah, for, for, for all the questions. Uh, yeah, it was, and thank you for inviting me again. It was, I'm happy to be here. It's our pleasure. Thank see you. you. See you around, I guess, maybe next CVPR. Yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe. This one, definitely, yeah. <laughs> have a great day. You too. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks a lot. Thank you.